Alright, so you're walking through the woods, whether it's for a jog to go fishing or to let your dog water the trees in special way. Until suddenly, this shows up! At first, this may look like a regular pond in the woods, but if you look closer... Ah, look at all that disgusting scum is so brown! Oh my gosh, it looks like this pond is poison or something! I bet there are evil fungi at the bottom of it. Ew! And look at those terrifying bugs! They look like they came from some horror sci-fi flick where they obviously eat people! Why should these things exist on this planet?! Okay, calm down. It really seems like you haven't been educated what these things are. Hey, scene's believing, isn't it? Well, have you ever heard, don't judge a book by its cover? I thought so. So if you really want to know what's going on in this supposed witch's cauldron, put on some rubber boots as I, Joe Hernandez, show you the secrets of Bruno Blues. So as you may have guessed from the title, this is more properly known as a Bruno Blues. What makes this different than a normal pond? To be a vertical or not to be a vertical? Actually, that's a pretty good question. The big secret is, it's not fed by any rivers, streams, or creeks. Which basically means that it's a big puddle fed by rain. This, of course, adds some new conditions for this little habitat. For example, most ponds get a little bit of circulation thanks to some incoming water flow. But since this doesn't have that, this place has very little oxygen and can get really acidic on the leaves that fall in it. So, sorry, there are no poisonous fungi down there. As cool as that would be. Another thing, there's no fishes in here because there's no water coming in. What? What? There are species of tropical pillyfish that have adapted for living in vernal pools in South and Central America? Wow, I never knew that. But at least in all of New Jersey, all vernipoles are fish free, which makes them a special place for tons of creatures, especially amphibians. All frogs, toads, and salamanders start their lives as aquatic larvae, like one of these tadpoles. When they live in this form in ponds and rivers, they have to deal with the most common predator, fish. Ah, now you see it. If these larvae live in vernal pools, then they don't have to worry about predators at all. This makes amphibians the biggest fans of vernal pools. Sometimes if a salamander lives out here in the deep woods, they would travel great distances exposed to just reach one of those mere puddles. That almost sounds like an amphibian party. And to add to the excitement, there's a ton of activity going on. Like singing or wrestling for a mate. I mean, listen to this. Now that's something I can jam to. To the music! When it comes to decorations, you may have to wait till next morning. Frog, toad, and salamander eggs may feel slimy, but they come in a variety of shapes that are truly worth looking at. So now you know what a vertical pool is and how important it is for amphibians. But, unfortunately, the story's not over. You see, thanks to humanity's bad habit of not letting an open space of wilderness exist, all over New Jersey, there are vernal pools being built on top of, built next to, and polluted with more chemicals than a kid's chemistry set. Now wait a second! Let's go back and see that again. Vernal pools being built on top of, built next to... What creature in the Garden State would care if we built next to their little nook in the woods? Any creature that hates being crushed by rolling rubber. See, most amphibians, when migrating to the vernal pools and back home, they do it during rainy nights which also happens to be the time when drivers are least wary on the roads. So when people build roads in the path to their breeding pool, it'll only result in a slew of dead fur bodies across the asphalt. With all factors in play, there are a total of 15 species of amphibians that are on the state endangered, threatened, and special concern list. The surprising thing is, is that many of them are really amazing. Like check out this Pine barren tree Frog with its bright green hue or the blue spotted salamander with its marbled black and blue skin. Also, check out this brilliant eastern tiger salamander. So is there anything that people are doing to help these animals? I'm happy to say that there are. Across NJ during the breeding season of most amphibians, 
Scientists and volunteers from different organizations go out on rainy nights to give the critters a helping hand as they carry them to their destined side of the road. So maybe you're not that out in the rain during the night kind of person. But there are other ways you can help out these amphibians. First of all, if you notice that there's going to be a building or road built near or on a vertical, you could contact the people in authority and let them know how important the habitat is to the local wildlife. Another thing to do is not use pesticides or other chemicals on your yard. As fun as these things are to use, these are pollutants to any water body they run off into. They're especially dangerous for amphibians because of their ability to breathe through the skin, making the slight touch of it deadly. And think of this, if you leave your yard free of pesticides, you might have more amphibians slurping up all those insects you ate. And last but not least, you could create your very own vernacle, like the one that they built at New Jersey Audubon's Waddle Stewardship Center. Using a pond liner, some sediment, a bit of digging, and a ton of native plants, people have created a safe place for herbs and insects to breed. And even if you don't have a vertical as big as this one, if you have a small one that's next to a forest or a swamp, you'll be helping out a ton of endangered amphibians near you. So the next time you go wandering through the woods and you find a vertical like this one, closer look. I'm sure you'll see it differently. I've been Joe Hernandez, and those are the secrets of vernacle.